I'm Claudia Catania, and you're listening to Playing On Air. Hey there, listeners. If you're joining us every week, you might notice a bit of audio variation this season. Some episodes were recorded in studio before quarantine, and some were recorded, well, a bit closer to home. At home. So fair warning, you may notice variable audio quality and whatnot on this episode. Let's just call it immersive theater. And away we go. You're about to hear Third Grade by MacArthur Fellow Dominique Moriso. Dominique has won widespread acclaim for her three-play cycle, The Detroit Project, garnered a Tony nomination as book writer of Broadway's Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations, and built a reputation as one of the great stage and screenwriters working today. If you're a regular listener, you've already heard some of her other short plays on Playing on Air, Last Spring's Night Vision, and Giselle the Gazelle, which we released a few weeks ago. Today, Third Grade is directed by Story Ayers. It features J. Alphonse Nicholson of Stars P. Valley and Broadway's A Soldier's Play and the playwright herself, Dominique Moriso. Music is by guest composer Jimmy Keyes. And now, Third Grade. It's a late night at work in a classroom in a New York City public school. Kai, a third grade teacher, sits at her desk typing. Blog entry number 13. Another late night at work. Revamping the lesson plans yet again. I still can't figure out how to make my students comprehend. Today's class was painful. Cherie is not understanding the difference between nouns and pronouns. And when I try to help her, she starts crying profusely. (laughs) I think she's afraid of being wrong. Maya keeps falling asleep on the math lessons. Her family doesn't make her go to bed at night. So... Malcolm and Leland have become the new class bullies, no matter how many times I'd separate them. I tried calling their parents, and the father accused me of picking on them. And no matter how many times I asked Jason to remove his hat, he refused. The third grade practice test is coming up, and I am very concerned for my students. I want to be effective, get them to the next level, If they fail, then so do I. And for this, I am frightened. You Miss Madison? The kids call me Miss M, but please call me Kai. You my son's teacher? Well, let's see who's your son. Jason. Jason still? Oh, yes, Jason. Jason, yeah, I saw his teacher. I've never met you before. You're Mr. Steele? Yeah. Well, Mr. Steele, it's quite late. The school is actually closed right now. But I can talk for a moment about Jason if you like. Did Eddie let you in? Yeah. He told me what you did. What I did? How you was disrespecting him. Eddie? Nah, my son. Mr. Still, I don't disrespect my students. Whatever Jason told you, he's exaggerating. You asked him to take off his hat? I did, but that's hardly disrespect. It's school policy. Students take off their hats. I just enforce the rules. Why you gotta embarrass my son for? It's not embarrassment. If Jason's not listening, I'm going to target him so that he understands his defiance is not acceptable. You seen his hair? I haven't. He refused to take off his hat today. I gave up. You seen his hair? No, Mr. Steele, I haven't seen his hair. It's burnt. What? He burnt it. Hair caught on fire. I had no idea Jason was in a fire. The school didn't report that. There wasn't no house fire. He was just playing around with matches, him and his brother. I told their mama not to leave matches around, but she smoked too much and can't nobody make her quit. So they found him and start playing with him. His brother lit his hair on fire and I had to pat it out. I had no idea. His hair is burnt. It's uneven and don't nothing make it look right. Not even when his mama corn wrote it. It looked crazy. You know what I'm saying? I think I understand. Perhaps you could write him a note, Mr. Steele. He could bring it to class, and then I could allow him to keep his hat on. You already messed up. Messed up? I ain't come here to talk this out. I came here to settle something. Mr. Still, I'm not sure I understand. But if you came to cause some kind of trouble... You know what they did to him? Who? Them kids. Them boys that's in your class. The ones that's always be messing with Jay. 
If you're talking about Malcolm and Leland, don't worry. I've called their parents today. They've been bothering everyone. You know what they did? No, I don't. I don't know what they did. They chased them. They chased them after school, chased them to a dead end, and that's where they cut them. What? You know your kids got blades? They, they're third graders. I, I You know. No, I didn't know. Jason's at the hospital. Is he all right? He's with his mama. He go pull through. Could have been fatal. Oh, my God. Is there something I can do? You shouldn't have messed with him, lady. I didn't. Uh, <sighs> Mr. Steele, I'm trying to explain. Jason's a good kid. I know he is. And he's very bright, too. He wanted to learn. He's still learning. I'm his father. I understand. He's my only son. You know what I'm saying? I got to protect him. Mr. Steele, I understand how you feel, but I'm not Jason's enemy. It's like the knife in. You know, that, that happens. Your know, kids got to fend for themselves sometimes, but the embarrassment, you know what I'm saying? That's like the shit that stays with you. You, in, you embarrassed him. I just asked him to take off his hat. All day you asked him until them boys got curious about why he wouldn't take it off. You made my son a target. You made him weak. Mr. Steele, Jason isn't weak. He's young. You made him look soft. Them boys, they thought they could run them. I can't believe... Believe. Mrs. Steele, I know you're upset. You have every right to be. But I'm not Jason's enemy. If you give me a chance to think, I, maybe I can call Leland and Malcolm's parents again. What's going on his parents supposed to do? We can put our heads together and figure out how to take action. I'm taking action. What do you mean? I want addresses to these kids' houses. I want them now. I can't... <laughs> I won't. I don't want you to do something dangerous. Jason needs you. Jason got me. I'm his father. You understand? I know you're his father. Then find those addresses. What are you plans? What do you think you're going to do? Asking stupid questions. I'm going to handle this. Let Jason get his honor back. That's what. By what? Fighting? Hurting these kids? Their families? That's not going to solve anything. It'll solve it for now. No solution is permanent. Everything temporary till the next battle. We had parent-teacher conferences two weeks ago. So? I didn't see you there. You being smart. I'm being direct. Third grade regions are approaching. Jason needs to pass or he'll stay behind. You want to give him honor? Help him study? Nah, you ain't failing, Jason. Won't be my choice. It'll be the state's. You his teacher. Figure it out. It's not... It can't just be me. He needs more. You. He got me. It would have been nice to meet you, is all I'm saying, at the conferences. Where have you been? Excuse me? His second grade teacher, Miss Porter, she used to bring him home after school sometimes, make sure he got home safe if he was in trouble. You're saying I should bring him home? That's not my job, Mr. Steele. I'm not Miss Porter. I have a lot of others. Can't be just you, right? That's right. Can't be just me either. He's your son. You think I don't take care of my son? I didn't say that. I teach him what I know. Well, that's good. Survival. But... That's what I know. Never a sign of weakness, inferiority, vulnerability. It'll make you disappear out there. You understand me? These streets will vaporize you. That's what I know. That's my care. Survive. And if he survives all of this and can't read or do math, he'll still be inferior. You got those addresses? I won't. I am not giving you the addresses, Mr. Steele. That is not how we do things here. It is against school policy. I look like I give a damn about school policy. Will you hurt me too? Threaten me for this? This is what I can do for my son. I'm his father. You understand me? I'm here, present, available, his defender. It, if he don't have me, who he got? He needs you, but not like this. Not like this? Why you teach here? Excuse me? This hood, this, this, this school, you choose it? I, what does that? Or, or was you sent here? Default, not your first pick. What does this matter, Mr. Steele? I'm here. I'm at this school. I'm committed. 
I stay late to get my students prepared and ready for the next day. What difference does it make if this school was or was not my first choice? I'm here. It makes a difference. You here by default. Just like us, default. Then, then choose the school, then choose the block, then choose the life. It chose us. It got dealt to us. Just like you, jacked up hand. You got to play out. You got to make do. And we play the games we good at, Miss Madison. The games we master, we stay away from the ones we never learn how to play because nobody has time to lose for the sake of playing around. We don't have time to try and fail because failure is death. It's the end. So you do what you got to do. You play what you know. This is what I know. And I want those addresses that you keep in your desk of yours with all kinds of after school papers and homework and toys you got. You, you took from kids and, and pencils and whatever the forms you used to call home to parents and complain to us about how our kids are misbehaving and your limited classroom management skills don't know how to put a kid in the damn corner or send them out the room rather than ruining my time that I could be spent making this paper so I can afford to keep a meal in my kid's mouth. It's default. All of us here. By default. And I'm playing what I know so I can win. Because if I lose, I lose way too much. You get me? I get you. These are the after-school forms for Leland and Malcolm. Leland's parents, the Gomez family. The mother is in the hospital. The father works double shifts for sanitation. Malcolm lives with his grandmother. She's just recovering from kidney stone removal. Here, Mr. Steele, go play your game. Go win back Jason's honor at all costs, even at his own cost. Make him hard. Make him as steel as his last name. But he's eight years old. I'm sorry he got cut. I'm sorry Malcolm and Leland are so angry and frustrated that they don't know what to do. But they're little boys, third graders, and they just need to be reminded of that. Give them a toy, compliment their work, give them a gold star, and you'll see them change before your very eyes. Their face is instantly youthful. They are children, and how they survive is by being that. Children. Keeping their youth, not having it toughened out of them. Here, Mr. Steele, take them. Go. Win for Jason. If you can. I'm a good father. I got my son's back. That's, that's more than most people got. He's going to win. Every night at work, more challenging than the one before. I am holding my breath for my students every day, holding my breath when they take a test, holding my breath when I ask for homework, holding my breath when they go to lunch and return and hopefully haven't gotten in a fight, holding my breath when they go home, hoping they'll be fed, be nourished, be helped, be bathed, and put to bed. Holding my breath the entire semester while I prepare them for the next level. Hoping that they make it. Hoping that they pass. Holding my breath until they win. You just heard Third Grade by Dominique Moriso, directed by Story Ayers, featuring J. Alphonse Nicholson as Steele and the playwright herself as Kai. Original music by Jimmy Keys. Playing on air would like to thank Dominique for sharing her bold and thought-provoking work with our listeners all this year and for joining us today. Can you all say your name and role or roles you played in the making of this remotely recorded play so listeners have no problem knowing voice from voice? Hi, I'm Story Ayers. I was the director. Hi, I'm Dominique Mariso, and I am. I was playing Kai, and I'm also the playwright. And I'm J. Alphonse Nicholson, and I had the pleasure of playing Still. Thank you.
So, Story, I remember after you directed Night Vision, another short play by Dominique Morisot, that playing on air recorded, you glowingly described Dominique as your mentor. How did that important relationship impact both of you today? Well, that's actually a great question. You know, this is my first time ever working with Dominique in these roles. I will admit we did do a check-in before today where I asked, how exactly do we navigate playwright actor in this space? And even in preparing for this, she mentored me on that. And so I'm grateful for uh, the advice that she gave and the space that we were able to create. Dominique, how do you feel? Um, (laughs) I'm laughing because Story likes to set me up. You know, (laughs) I feel fine. She called and asked, you know, like, how do we do me as playwright, her as director, and also me as actor. And I said, you know, you'll do what you do, and I'll join the conversation as needed, but there's equality and equity in this environment. <laughs> we're we're going to serve the vision that you have. I have not been thinking about this from a sonic point of view, and she has, you know, so she's the authority on that. Great. Well, you are both incredible. Alphonse, yes. you are currently killing it as Little Murda in Cable's P Valley, <laughs> but you are of the theater and played in Paradise Blue, one of Dominique's plays from her Detroit trilogy set in her hometown. Knowing that full length so well, were you able to spot her fingerprints on even this short piece? Absolutely. And thank you so much for the kind words as far as P Valley. I'm having such a great time working on that. Shout out to our good friend, Katori Hall, and everything she has going on. But similar to Katori Hall, Dominique leaves her imprint on anything she touches, literally. It could just be a conversation that you have with her. Just being in her presence for a small amount of time, she leaves an imprint on you. So when you read her work, having now worked on a few of her pieces, some full limbs, some shorter, but it's always the energy of Dominique is there. And that's, for me, just having a message that's going to resonate with the community in a real way and possibly having a message that the theater community in particular hasn't heard before or they're not as familiar with or they are familiar with and they kind of choose to ignore it. And Mm -hmm. so this sits similar in that realm where this is an issue that we know and we're familiar with, but when it comes to the stage, that story isn't always told or these people aren't always represented. And I think Dominique does that in a beautiful way every time and, Even in this 10 minutes, it feels full. It feels rich. I feel like we get a complete story arc of who these people are. And in any play that I've read of Dominique's or been able to perform, I always feel that. Like I have a full journey and I'm able to to really resonate with whoever I'm portraying or acting alongside. Mm -hmm. Do any of you recall your own third grade experience or school Hmm. or teacher? I want to hear Alphonse's answer to that question. (laughs) I I remember third grade because I gave my teacher a hard time in third grade. And (laughs) her name was Miss Barber. Shout out to Miss Barber. I hope she's still with us. And Mm -hmm. I went to an all-Black school, but we did have white teachers. So she was much different than Kai. But I do remember times where my mother would come in or my father would come in and have to have a parent-teacher conference. And they may be upset because at the time I was an actor and didn't even know it. So I would manipulate, you know, my parents into believing one thing happened and in all actuality, I was another. And I do remember Miss Barber getting very serious with my parents. Like, no, listen, I don't know what he does at home, but here <laughs> he's doing something different. And, you know, my mom, similar to still not wanting me to be a target, you know, and more so because this was a white woman, you know, and having these black students in her class. So that's how I kind of in my third grade experience. Uh, mm. stick with this one where it's kind of similar but different because the race is different and so you do have to be very careful on how you're talking to these students. Mm. So was Miss Barber unjust? No, I think Miss Barber was actually one of those teachers that had a lot of empathy and could mm. sit with us. She didn't grow up too far from where I grew up. Mm. You know, her house was down the street and so I think she was just but at the same time, you know, similar to this story, you just never know what these children are going through. You never know what, what's on the other side of things. And so we have to find a fine balance in communicating that. And I think she did a good job, similar to Kai. Yeah, that's funny because when I think of my third grade experience, it was, well, my third grade experience as a student is very different than as a teacher, <laughs> you know? 
Yeah. And I had a mother who was a teacher. My mother taught third grade. Aww. Shout out to my mama. Um, yeah. And so when I was in third grade and my mother was teaching third grade, I would go to my school. And then if I had a half day at my school, then I had to go to my mama's school. So then I had two school days. <laughs> and everybody else got to chill out and relax. I had to come <laughs> and be in her class after being in my own class. But my mother taught in an environment that was more stressful than my school because she taught in a, a you know in the Highland Park, Michigan, which is like a city inside of Detroit. And it is an economically stressed city inside of our own city. And then I went to school to like a magnet school that you had to test to get into in Detroit. You know, my third yeah. grade was like, I was trying to write plays and whatnot in the third grade. You know, yeah. I was writing like Cabbage Patch Kid novels and whatnot. <laughs> you know, I was, I was passing stuff around to my fellow classmates. There was one, a friend of mine, she is now an actress on a television series. But at that time in third grade, I approached her because I had this idea to do this play on my block, <laughs> on my porch and my neighborhood. Uh-huh. No idea how this was going to get produced. And I went to her and was like, would you like to be in my play? She was a new girl at school, you know? And I was like, yeah. I'm going to make friends with her. I'm going to put her in my play. <laughs> um, and I was bold in the third grade, but also really in a protected environment. I ended up teaching at my mom's school when I graduated college for a year, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And watching my mother navigate her third grade student, she had a student named Jason who wouldn't mm-hmm. take off his hat. And what made me want to lean on this is my mother was always say, you know, we're not supposed to let the kids wear hats, but Jason's hair is uneven. Or sometimes his hair is not done and he's embarrassed. So I'm not going to make him take off his hat. And then I started thinking, wow, what a insightful, thoughtful and holistic teacher my mother is. And what happens if a teacher doesn't have that education and knowledge on how to, you know, differentiate her students and give them individualized love? Even if you love your students, you might miss something like that. You might enforce rules over enforcing their humanity. Yeah. I love the aspect in Dominique's play of a parent having only what they know to teach. Anyone have thoughts about this motif in the play? Well, we talked about it when Story was directing us a little bit. We were both talking about the world that these two characters, Kai and Steel, are preparing Jason for. And and Story, I'll let you speak to this more, but you were saying that we're preparing him for two different worlds, in a sense. You know, Kai is preparing him for a, a world that has a little bit of longevity, and she sees a little further into the distance for him. And Steel is seeing in the immediacy they both have an interest in preserving Jason, you know, and preserving his life. But it's like, which kind of race are you in? And I think she's in a long distance race and he's in a sprint, you know, and neither one of those things is wrong, but they are in oftentimes in contrast to each other. And yes, you can only teach what you know and what you've experienced. And so the tragedy to me inside of the questions that we're asking is why For Jason, for this child, why does his short sprint mean that he has to armor up and prepare himself for defending himself against violence? And how can anyone prepare the young people, including the father? Like, how can you get to the long distance sprint if your short sprint is always about buffering? You know, when life has you on the defense, you can't play offense. You know, and so if you're just preparing for shielding bullets or shielding attack or shielding yourself from violence, then how can you proactively create a safe haven, a proactively create like a holistic environment for yourself in which to grow and learn and see past tomorrow into maybe five tomorrows from now? And so that crime is not Jason's crime and it's not Steele's crime and it's not Kai's crime. The crime that that even it has to be their negotiation is a social crime against these particular kinds of communities. Absolutely. It's so interesting because I feel like Kai imagines or is preparing him for a future that Steele doesn't see. And it's about what options does my son have? And that's why I was saying when we were working on the piece, what world are we preparing them for? Because in Steele's mind, his world is about survival and surviving specifically, I feel like the streets where there's no room for vulnerability, inferiority, weakness. And that's the transgression that Kai has brought to to Jason, that you have disrupted his honor and his ability to survive these streets. 
So it's like survive is Still's point and thrive mm-hmm. is Ty's mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. And in reality, we want our young people to be able to not just have to survive. Right. I think communities that are under duress, whether you're under duress because of your socioeconomic status, because of the racial trauma you've experienced inside of your body politic, because of your gender, your gender identity, whatever, that you are experiencing life and experiencing every form of society, education, health, everything from a survivalist standpoint. Mm -hmm. And that that is in and of itself an attack on your humanity, that the best thing that you can be is a survivor. That's not enough of the human experience for you. And that's not fair. Mm -hmm. You know, that thriving inside of surviving is what everybody deserves. Everybody deserves the opportunity and the compassion and the concern to be able to thrive in this world and the attention placed on them socially to be able to thrive. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's making me think about a word that keeps coming up in the play, which is target. Mm. And you cannot thrive when you are a target. There are three little Black boys in this play, third graders. There's Jason, there's Malcolm, and Leland. And at some point, both of the adults refer to them as targets. Kai targets Jason to teach him a lesson. He has to follow the rules. And she uses that word. And then Steele then also uses target in reference to Malcolm and Leland to target them to get Jason's honor back. And then also Malcolm and Leland target Jason. So we've got the adults making the the young boys targets and then the young boys making each other a target. And when I think about the word target, I was like, what is that exactly? It is an object or person that you make the focus point for an attack. And when little Black boys are constantly under attack, there's no chance of them ever thriving, like you were saying, Dominique. Right. Dominique, what fuels you, your energy, your empathy, your confidence in what's arduous work as an artist and as an activist? You know, I think I am, I'm recognizing that I am a deep thinker. (laughs) And maybe sometimes that is how I navigate the world, you know, that I cannot help but to see the world in all of its depth. And I think what a friend told me yesterday was, you know, some people like to stay on the shallow end, (laughs) you know, and and you like to go deep and you got to have to just accept that you like to go deep. And I think it's easier to go on the shallow end. I think people enjoy shallow swimming, you know, but I, I made for the deep and I don't know how to be any other way. So that's how I see the world. So what fuels me is the depth and layer to our humanity. I see us and I want to know more. I want to understand what's behind an action. Every action, there is like something that was underneath that action. There's a root to every tree, you know, to every branch, to every leaf on a tree. There's a root to that tree. And I don't, I just don't know any other way to move socially if we not go into the root. And I don't think we're aware of how much we escape the root of problems. <laughs> like, I think that it sounds like a cliche that we know, but we don't realize how every day we're escaping the root of a problem. Every day we want to relax. We don't want to think that much, or we want to end an argument before it really begins. We don't want to delve into having uncomfortable conversations. We just want to not get to the root, you know? And I just don't know how to get over anything how to get through something, how to conquer an injustice that I don't know the root of. So that's what charges me as an artist and and an activist. I'm determined to get to the root of things because I don't know how to heal if I can't figure out where the source of the hurt comes from. Right. And my truest desire is to heal. That's what I really want to do. I want to heal the damage that's been done to me and in that help other people heal the damage done to them help us collectively heal. If my personal healing can inspire healing in somebody else, that's that's cool. But there will be no healing if there's no root cause and pulling the problem up from the root. There can be no healing of the issue. Yeah. It's beautiful. I can't say that I so willingly go into the deep. <laughs> 
Um, I mean, listen, I would love to just wade in the water. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel like I am allowed to, <laughs> I just, I feel like I see somebody drowning out there and I know how to swim. Why am I standing in the shallow end? I need to go deep. Yeah. Wow. Well, that was profound. I want yeah. to thank you all. Dominique Morisot, playwright for giving voice to important people. Story airs for directing this highly focused story and J. Alphonse Nicholson, who can make soft flesh out of steel. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Playing On Air, Great American Short Plays with Great American Actors. Associate producer, Michelle O'Brien. Literary manager, Bonnie Antosh. Literary assistant, Aditya Pratama. Marketing and Communications Manager, Shelley Horwitz. Theme music, Tom Kochan. Play music, Jimmy Keys. Audio editing, Rachel Kreidberg. Playing on Air is distributed by PRX, Public Radio Exchange. For Playing on Air, I'm your host, Claudia Catania. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>